The Rebel Capitalist Show. I've got one more history question before we, we move back to Peter. How many times in history have the people that are in favor of censorship been the good guys? Never. <laughs> not, not, not once. I mean, now bear in mind, history is, is a documentation. You know, it's a literary representation of what's happened. The literary documents that have survived over time, I mean, you go back to Thucydides or, or Herodotus or the, the great Roman um, uh, historians. Um, what has survived, what we know is every time there is this imposition of orthodoxy and we will punish, we will burn, we will crucify, right, we will right, right. exile. It's just a bad idea every time. I mean, you read Plato's apology about the trial of Socrates and you just, I mean, Socrates himself, it's like, you know, he, he very, in the most stoic way, accepts his fate. And he says, I'm not going to, you know, destabilize the situation. I'll accept what the court of law renders. But you guys really ought to be thinking very, very carefully about what you're doing, not only to me, but to the souls of everybody in this, um, in this city and everything that it represents for, you know, for the world. It's always a bad outcome. And it stunts the development across the whole spectrum of, of social, political, and economic, and then in this case, medical development. Look at places where there are dictatorships that maintain policies of censorship in the world right now. They, they are miserable, fearful, underdeveloped, benighted places of suffering. Yeah. Yeah. Places like the United States that have come to... If you're, if you're being suppressed and censored where you are and you have something to say and something to contribute, come to us and contribute to us. And look at the prosperity that we've had. How, how could our educated or purportedly educated class in the year 2022 be advocating censorship? It is an unfathomably mysterious thing to me. Yeah, one of the main things is as a society, and especially the intellectuals, I think they're, they've gotten in this habit of looking at things as black and white, good or evil, instead of doing a cost-benefit analysis and saying, sure, if we allow you know, absolute free speech, there's going to be some things that happen that we don't want. But that's the, the best, or that's the least bad um, formula we have. That's, that's the, the least bad approach. So let's just look at the world through a constrained view, understand that we're imperfect human beings living in an imperfect world and do what has worked best throughout history, although it's not perfect. Uh, Peter, what, what would you say, I'm sure you've given this a lot of thought, what's the slippery slope that we are on right now in your world as a result of this type of censorship? The slippery slope is that the interchange is, is now different. I'll give an example. A few years ago, uh, you know, maybe I would uh, publish a paper and make a statement regarding uh, lowering cholesterol and coronary heart disease. And then another doctor at another academic institution, you know, and that doctor had a reputation and a track record. He would say, no, the cholesterol drugs work this way. And, and there would be an interchange. And Everybody knew who each other were. We're, we're trying, we're both seeking truth, but we have different viewpoints. The new normal is uh, anonymous fact-checking by uh, almost certainly uncredentialed people making false counterclaims. So this is actually, these are methods of propagandists. Right. For every statement uh, in my field, there, there needs to be support. So if you say it's safe, well, there has to be support for that. Well, safe, okay, well, let's discuss the data on safe. And then if we say effective, let's discuss the data on effective. But now, uh, you know, with widely deployed worldwide programs, there's actually no discussion of the data on safety or efficacy. And in some countries, this is extreme. Remember, this is a worldwide problem. India, for example, this has gone to the Indian Supreme Court. It's gone all the way up. 
there has been zero disclosure to 1.3 billion people of any data in that population on safety and efficacy of a widely administered program of which people are asked to take. Yeah, right, right. You know, one example I've been using on my videos, uh, and I was using big time during 2020 and 21, is uh, the example of Jacobson versus Massachusetts in 1905. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with this Supreme Court case, but it was regarding, we'll call them uh, medicine mandates back then. And back then they didn't force people. It wasn't that type of mandate. It was just, if you chose not to do X, Y, or Z, they would give you a fine. It was like a $5 fine. It's the equivalent of about $150 today. And this person, uh, Jacobson says, no, I'm, I'm not gonna do that. So he sued Massachusetts. This goes to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court actually favored on the side of Massachusetts saying, yes, you can find this person for not taking that medicine. Fast forward to 1927, we get to a Supreme Court case called Bell, uh, Buck versus Bell. And this is where Oliver Wendell Holmes came out, the Supreme Court justice, and he used the Jacobson versus Massachusetts case as precedence for their decision. And their decision was basically to legalize eugenics. They used this decision, Jacobson versus Bell, or excuse me, Jacobson versus Massachusetts, for in the Buck versus Bell case to legalize forced sterilization, which is basically legalizing eugenics. And so that's the slippery slope that once you start here, once you give the government that type of power and control, once we start giving the government the power to tell us what is misinformation, what is truth, that takes us to a place maybe two years, 10 years, 20 years down the road where we, we don't want to be. That, that gets very, very ugly uh, or it has the potential to do that. And that's what I think people miss when they're, if they're doing a cost benefit analysis on what has happened in 20 and 20, uh, 2021. Yeah, it's actually a larger loss than imprisonment. People have said to put a person in prison is the greatest loss of freedom you could have. And I've always said you can go one step further. You can force something into that body against someone's mm -hmm. will. Right. And, right. and then that's actually worse than imprisonment. That, that is a closer, more proximate violation of personal autonomy than one yeah. can ever have. Or a forced sterilization, forced lobotomy. I mean, right. any of these right. things. That That's the, the road that you get on. That's the end game here once you start giving the government that type of power and control. You know, um, it's, it's interesting. That was a notable example of Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. lacking good jurisprudence. He should have had a conversation with his father, Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr. He was a great doctor. A lot of our a modern understand conceptual framework of the practice of medicine really comes from the writings of Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr. And he famously observed that science um, is, is always incomplete. Um, he, he called science the topography of ignorance. Um, mm -hmm. We have these little things that we discover and we have these little vantage points that enable us to see things. We gain insight into nature. But these vantage points, from these vantage points, we can triangulate vast areas that we, we know nothing about. Um, so he had a tremendous, Oliver Wendell Holmes, he was a great doctor in his day. He had a tremendous humility. He understood, you know, there's so much we don't know. The only way for knowledge to continue to build is, is it's, it's through this multiplicity, it's an evolution of observation and debate. And there, there can't be an authoritative you know, moment in which any generation of medical men or scientists say, okay, now we understand the full- We figured it out. <laughs> we figured it out. And, you know, you had these, you know, these guys, these are Harvard men, both father and son. But, you know, we get up to 1970 and the head of neurology at, at Harvard was advocating these lobotomies with electrodes going in and destroying tissue in the frontal cortex. And one of the guys in our book is Peter R. Bragan. 
who's written a book about our current state of affairs. And Dr. Bragan went toe to toe with these lobotomy advocates, these psychosurgery advocates at Harvard and, and won. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it, there is a tremendous arrogance of any generation saying, we figured it out, we know what's best for, you know, and most salubrious for mankind. Anyone that challenges us or has a dissenting opinion is wrong and should be censored. Yeah. Um, yeah. This I mean, is if you think about it, if there would have been social media back in the 1920s, uh, they most likely would have labeled anything that was against eugenics, scientific disinformation, because yeah. that 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 idea that there's just some people that are genetically inferior or some people that are genetically superior, that was the quote unquote science back then. It was yeah, the just to, just to point out how wrong we get it in the and in the, in the topics of the day, you know, in the. Uh, the, the, actually, it was a Pulitzer Prize winner, I believe, uh, The Emperor of All Maladies by Mukherjee, uh, a, a young fellow at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. You know, he writes about lung cancer. And one of the lead surgeons studying lung cancer, to the very day he died, he operated on lung cancer. He was convinced it was not due to smoking. Mm, and he wow. himself smoked and he, he himself died of lung cancer. He, and he, when he went to the grave, he truly believed lung cancer was not due to smoking. That's how wrong we get it. You know, in my lifetime, uh, when I trained at uh, Parkland Memorial Hospital in, in Dallas, the, the most common surgery we did was called a vagotomy and pyloroplasty 2. It was a stomach surgery. And we were doing the stomach surgery for ulcers in the stomach. This is in my career time frame. And it turned out the ulcers were due to a bacteria called Helicobacter pylori that we had no idea that in fact a bacteria. And so once we learned to treat the bacterial infection with a triple drug therapy, the surgeries went away. Wow. And uh, so those are examples of how wrong we have it. But for the first time in my career, uh, a priori, a priori, there was a pervasive a view that the crisis at hand was absolutely untreatable with therapeutics. 